wanted to begin, because it is June, with the uh, annual meeting. You should have minutes from the 2013 meeting at your places. Commissioner Singer. Present. Commissioner Small. Present. Commissioner Scott. Here. Commissioner Dawkins. Here. Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Woods. General Counsel Ira Goldenberg. Here. Okay, our first step is to approve these minutes of last year's meeting. Any comments, corrections? Um, point of information for me. Yes. Uh, since I was not at that meeting, I don't think that I can, uh, mm -hmm. can vote on it. Very good. Right. I wasn't either. Any work further? No, I was not. The two of us were. No, the remaining commissioners can vote. The remaining commissioners who were present can comment or offer a motion for approval. I make a motion to approve the minutes. All in favor? Can I? They can abstain. All, right. right. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. At this point in the meeting, I... I just want to be clear, were, were the votes of Commissioner Small and Dawkins, were they abstentions or enabling? Well, they, it's votes? an abstention for me. Oh, I didn't make any. I wasn't even <laughs> board member. Right? I, I would have, I'm abstaining as well, okay. for the record. Yeah, just that we yeah. needed yeah. some action. Okay, just okay. so Two votes in favor, two abstentions. Okay. One, one vote in favor, mm -hmm. two abstentions. No, two, 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 two in favor. Sorry, two, two in favor. favor. Two in favor. Two abstentions, none opposed. Okay. Okay. Um, at this point in the meeting, I will step down as chair. Mm -hmm. All officers are, are all officers are located at this point. I will turn the meeting over to our second chair. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, we before we go into our formal housing authority meeting because uh, June is our, our year end month we will have our uh, annual meeting today but I did want to just take a moment to welcome uh, the series of visitors that we do have at um, our meeting this evening. Uh, the chair has vacated the position to make way for nominations for offices of the housing authority as is called for in, the, in our bylaws for uh, the next fiscal year. Uh, so, I, so I'll be presiding until the slate of officers have been have been nominated and elected. So um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that we start with position of chair. Yes, that is correct. Okay. So I'll take I'll accept nominations uh, from commissioners for the position of chairperson for the next fiscal year for housing Authority. I nominate Eliza Singer to continue as chair. I'll second. Second. Any other? Nominations, and I'll ask for a motion for nominations to be closed. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, it, it's been moved to close nominations for position of chair of the housing authority and seconded on the question. And roll we'll call on the resolution to close nomination for position of chair. Roll. 
all commissioners. Of all commissioners, uh, as commissioners. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Singer. To close nominations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Small. Yes. Commissioner Scott. Yes. Reverend Dawkins. Aye. Rick Smith. No. Commissioner Woods. Thank you. So um, it's been moved and approved to close nominations for the position of chair. At this point in time, I will entertain a motion uh, for Ms. So Ms. Singer has been been nominated and seconded. So the nominations are closed. Nominations are closed. So I'll call now for a vote on the motion by Commissioner Dawkins for Ms. Singer to remain as chairperson of the House. Okay. Commissioner Singer? Yes. Commissioner Small? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Dawkins? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Woods? Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll move, continue moving on to the slate. Our current vice chairperson is Ms. Sheila Small. That position has been vacated. And I will, at this point in time, um, entertain motions for the position of vice chair of the House of Authority. I make a motion that um, the vice chair continue as the vice chair. Uh, okay, so the move is moved by Commissioner Dawkins, second Commissioner Scott, that Sheila Small would be nominated for the position of vice chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so um, if there are no other nominations, I'll accept a motion to close nominations for the position of vice chair. So moved. Second. Second. Let me know when you're ready. Uh, that was and Lisa Singer. Lisa Singer, okay. Moved. Commissioner Dawkins, second. And this is to close nominations for the position of vice chair. Been moved and seconded to close the nomination for the vice chair. Um, on the question, roll call. Commissioner Singer? Yes. Commissioner Small? Commissioner yes. Scott? Yes. Commissioner Dawkins? Aye. Commissioner Smith? And Commissioner Woods? Our current treasurer, uh, Ms. Beverly Scott, this will be Ms. Scott's last meeting as a commissioner for the Housing Authority as her tenure of term conclude um, at the end of business today. Um, so um, we will be electing a new commission, a new treasurer <laughs> for the Housing Authority. So at this point in time, I will accept nominations for the position of treasurer of the Housing Authority. I nominate Reverend Dr. Harry Dawkins. A second. of treasurer has been moved and seconded for Commissioner Dawkins. Are there any other nominations for the position of treasurer? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to close the nominations for the position of treasurer. Second. Moved and seconded. Are you ready? Moved and seconded. Okay. On the question? Commissioner Singer? Oh, I'm quite ready for roll call. Okay. Almost ready for roll call. On the question? Roll call, please. Commissioner Singer? Yes. Commissioner Small? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Dawkins? Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Woods? Our final officer position for the housing authority is that of secretary. Our current uh, secretary position is held by Commissioner Smith. And I will accept at this point in time nominations for the position of secretary with the housing authority. I'll make a nomination for Mr. Smith to continue as a secretary. It's been moved and seconded for Richard Smith to serve as secretary of the Housing Authority for the next fiscal year. Any other nominations 
for the position of secretary. Hearing none, I'll accept a motion to close nominations for the position of secretary. I move that we close nominations. The closing of the nomination has been moved and seconded on the question. Roll call. Commissioner Singer? Yes. Commissioner Small? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Dawkins? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Woods? Thank you. I'll now take a roll call vote on the election of Richard Smith as Secretary for the House Authority. On the question, roll call. Commissioner Singer? Yes. Commissioner Small? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Dawkins? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Woods? Thank you all. As mm -hmm. the officers of the Housing Authority have been duly nominated, and elected. I will at this point in time turn the meeting over to our newly re-elected chairperson of the Housing Authority, Ms. Elisa Singer, with the uh, gratitude and appreciation of all here for excellent service in the past and excellent service no doubt to come in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Horton, uh, for your performance as acting chairperson. Um, we continue with any old business carrying over from last year's annual meeting. to adjourn to June, the second Monday in June 2015. So moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. And we'll need those of you. Actually, hopefully next winter will not make the next annual meeting seem so far away. <laughs> Uh, you should have the minutes of the regular June meeting at your places. while we produce the May 2014 minutes. When the, the minutes, when the board package was sent out, it appeared that the April minutes were attached as a file mm -hmm. statement as opposed to the May minutes. So uh, as far as we reproducing those. I saw the email I for it with the right. link, but I didn't try and open it. Mm -hmm. I was curious if um, anyone else had any difficulty with the link, with the Dropbox link. Yeah, I had noticed, I think it was fun. So I had to see the attachment. Right, right. I just right. didn't know whether the attachment was the most updated one. Interestingly enough, um, we tried to send a series of very large files um, to HUD using Dropbox and mm -hmm. got a call. They are the actual main minutes, it's just the dates and hours. Oh, okay, okay. Right. so that's, that's perfect. perfect. That's, that's, that's better. Oh, that's better, yeah. <laughs> so the blue line I just put through.
Yes. yes. Does anyone still need a copy of them? This would be the May 2014 minutes. Have anyone destroyed them or? They should be part of the board packet. Does anybody need a packet? I'm going to you to get the door because there may be uh, there may be Rick Lord and Mr. Wood. Oh, oh, we're 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 thank you. 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 Thank to accept the April 7th minutes. This, are, this is the April 7th. So no, it can't be. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be May. Well, everything what? else referring to, to as if happening, to happen in April as well. Mm -hmm. The groundbreaking, the agency plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. April 7th, May 12th, right? And we said it's nothing different in the day, right? But everything I read is referring to events to occur in the future. Um, most of this. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Right. I, I understand what the, the text that you're referring to. Um, but I think it might have just oh, it's been. Different. Uh, different. Yeah. Mine is different. April 7th, it says, but it is different. <coughs> this is, I don't know, this is, this is 
the April. This is the real April. That's the real April 7th. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I really did print. Okay. So do you need a copy of the May minute? I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. So the May minutes actually erroneously are dated April 7th. Mm -hmm. As opposed the to real, the April the 7th minutes. The real April 7th. Oh, I got them. Okay. I can discard these. Well, we've got to be quick with this. <laughs> All right. I see. Calling the June 2014 meeting of the Chinese Housing Authority to order. Uh, Angela, please call me. Sure. Call the roll. Commissioner Singer. Present. Commissioner Small. Here. Commissioner Scott. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Commissioner Dawkins. Here. Commissioner Woods. General Counsel Ira Golden. Present. Uh, has everyone had a chance now to read the correct minutes? No. <laughs> no let's take a few minutes. No, I thought I had them, but it's, right. it's okay. I, what I had is important. Here you go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, let me begin by acknowledging our many visitors this evening. And, um, some are here as visitors and others are here to make presentations, but I want to acknowledge and welcome all of our visitors. I uh, next would like to acknowledge that this is Commissioner Scott's last meeting as a commissioner with the Housing Authority. I unfortunately did not know how many years, Madam. Mm -hmm four years as a commissioner with the Housing Authority, so I know that I speak for everyone when um, I express on behalf of the Housing Authority and the residents that we serve our sincere appreciation for the two four years. Four years as you know, this is a very exciting time in the life of the Housing Authority, and I'm certain that we will have no shortage of other opportunities for Ms. Scott should she choose to, to continue to uh, serve and be a member of the Housing Authority family. We are hoping to put together a small welcome reception for our two commissioner-elects so that um, the resident community may um, have the opportunity to be formally introduced to them and um, that might also offer an opportunity for us to, in a more formal way, thank and recognize Ms. Scott for her years of service as well. So, so thank you very much, Ms. Scott. Thank you. I did want to uh, uh, remind everyone, I think hopefully you received the postponement notice uh, via email that we have postponed the groundbreaking. I did have the opportunity to speak with Ms. Boyano, and while she is hoping to give us a date this month, she is at this point in time thinking that it may, as a practical matter, be after the 4th of July. 
um, as board members may know, uh, we selected the original date in the hopes that that would be the best date that we could get participation from the governor. Uh, the legislature ends the 12th of June, and so we thought the 13th would be a good date, but that's cutting it a little close. So Ms. Foliano is in communication with the governor's office and the effort to get another date. No guarantees that he'll be able to attend based on the schedule, but we're doing everything possible to maximize his participation. So um, so please stay tuned. The moment we get a new date, um, I will pass that on to everyone, and we are in the process of sending out postponement emails, phone calls, and communication to um, <coughs> all the folks who receive a copy of the invitation. So we're going to postpone until we get the governor to show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to uh, we're going to make every effort to have uh, the governor participate. As you know, in the phase one was a multi-departmental mm -hmm. phase with the number of department of uh, the county, the city of New Rochelle, as well as the state funding and participating. Phase two is uh, it's an exclusively New York State funded um, enterprise. So so. We're, I, I, I'm not going to go through, as you can see, there are seven items uh, on the agenda for this evening. I'm going to uh, truncate uh, much of it um, so that we have as much time as possible to spend on some of the things that I think will require a great deal of uh, discussion, and particularly the, um, the RAD update and the Gracie, um, post-draft Gracie RFP. Uh, but I do want to let you know that all the laundry rooms are operational. Uh, we have renovated all the laundry rooms, installed new equipment, and um, we uh, distributed gift cards with $5 value to all residents of all the locations, and those rooms are uh, operational at this point in time. We did have the bid opening on uh, Friday in the past for architectural and engineering services, uh, so I do not want to, uh, hopefully I will not have to wait until the July meeting to make present my recommendations to the board. So once I've had the opportunity to review them, I'll forward uh, those recommendations on to board members in the, in the hopes that we may be able to have a special meeting uh, to uh, to identify. We only received two. We received two. One. Is it still open or it's closed? It's uh, closed. It was closed as of Friday. And uh, so um, some of that work is roof work. So for obvious reasons, I don't want to lose the summer. So um, we may be make, I'll be making a recommendation to the board in the very near future. We received um, HUD correspondence, which is in your packet. I would ask you to take a look at that, as well as a proposed HUD recovery plan from HUD, which is also in your packet. I would ask you to please take a look at that. I'm going to, I attended a very significant RAD resident rental assistance demonstration program meeting at HUD headquarters in Washington last week. And I'm just going to spend a moment to review some of it with you. It was a summit called by HUD at HUD headquarters, which was very unusual. It was not the usual hotel ballroom type of situation, but actually at HUD headquarters. It was attended by current Secretary Sean Donovan, who is going through the Senate confirmation process for um, the, the administration's new Director of, of the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. Um, it was significant that he took time to attend uh, because it was the only time that he spent at HUD headquarters that day. And actually, much of his staff, when he made that announcement, was uh, very disappointed and chagrined because when he showed up, they assumed they had him for the whole day. Mm -hmm. um, but he made it clear that uh, the 30 minutes he was spending at the conference was the only time he would spend in the, in the building. And then he was off for his courtesy calls on the Hill as well as briefing on the budget for the fact that he did attend um, lent um, a significant um, signal to the importance that HUD has put on the RAD program. So if you forgive me for a moment, I'm going to just walk through a couple of slides on this PowerPoint display. And uh, as you know, the rental assistance demonstration project is just that. It's a pilot project. And Congress, oh, yeah, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Congress um, initially authorized HUD to convert 60,000 units from the public housing platform to the RAG platform. 
And um, but that 60,000 units was very quickly oversubscribed. And as of today, there are over 185,000 units mm -hmm. um, that are in the queue for the rental assistance demonstration and project. And while we were in Washington on both Wednesday and Thursday of last week, on Wednesday of last week, the Senate subcommittee uh, voted to lift the cap from 60,000 to 185,000. And then on Thursday of last week, the full Senate committee on um, Veterans Affairs, Transportation, and HUD, the VA um, HUD um, <coughs> committee voted to uh, lift the cap as well. So this was, so as you know, we um, used a consultant last year um, in the communities group to prepare our RAD application. Our RAD application was submitted at the end of last year. We are in that 185,000 pool. Uh, so we're very excited by the fact that the Senate has voted to lift the ban. Uh, now the House has to act, and it's expected that the House will probably act after the summer recess, but shortly before October of next of this year which is when the federal fiscal year begins. So the federal fiscal year is going to be October 1 to September 30th. So this is a little information on uh, the RAD units that are pending in the pipeline so far. And this is a breakdown of where most of the RAD applications have come from throughout the country. As you can see, the South and West have been very, very aggressive in their submitting of applications, a little less so in the Northeast. And this data was as of um, a couple of weeks ago, so it's, it's through the end of last year. Um, and these are the top 10 applicants. And where they stand, as you can see, a CHAP is a Commitment for a Housing Assistance Payment Contract, and that's the elixir, if you will, of RAD. That's what everybody is after, that Section 8 contract. That's a, so once you have that commitment, uh, that's HUD saying that uh, for at the time that you convert, they will provide a Section 8 contract for um, your unit, and once you have that, um, then you're in a real position to begin to leverage that second <coughs> contract with additional funding. So you can see why NYCHA is not represented. No, actually, I don't know why NYCHA is not represented. No. And, uh, there weren't any NYCHA representatives at the conference either. So <coughs> they, they didn't apply. Yeah, they may not have applied. They didn't. Yeah, they might have their own pipeline. <coughs> yeah. They might they have their own apply. pipeline. They may not. Mm -hmm. uh, this is by size, and this is very, uh, this is very significant because uh, most of the smaller PHAs, and even though you can see from the chart that uh, small PHA here is defined as a PHA less than 250 units, we are still by HUD classified as a PHA because a small PHA because we have less than 500 units. Um, so you can see most of the smaller and the medium-sized PHAs have been those that have participated. In many ways, that's not surprising because as you know, a small agency such as ourselves, we have to comply with the same HUD regulations that NYCHA and Boston and Chicago do. Mm -hmm. So we, we're not relieved of the regulatory burden, even though we have, don't have the resources and staff to comply with it. So that's one of the reasons why when you speak with a lot of the small PHAs, they say it's simply to uh, relieve them of that compliance burden that many of them have, but still be able to f fulfill their mission of providing housing for their communities. Uh, this is urban versus rural. You see, majority of the um, housing authorities that apply for that are elderly versus family. And now, this is a, into the weeds a little bit. Project based rental assistance versus project based voucher are two Section 8 funding programs, and they operate. Um, they operate uh, similarly, but there are important differences based on how you're going, if you're going to leverage it with additional financing, such as an FHA mortgage or tax credits. So as you can see, uh, some of the, the, if you have an FHA Sunny Maid insured, it uh, provides a, a, that additional uh, comfort to the investment community that, the, that any participation by them will be insured by the federal government. Uh, so that's why you see the distinction between FHA versus conventional. I'd like to just go back for a moment. Primarily what drives this determination, we do not have to elect whether we're going to go PBRA versus PBV <coughs> until such time as we actually receive a commitment from HUD. At that point in time, we have to elect. For purposes of our application, we do not have to decide. And there are slight, it's slightly, it's a little more difficult, but slightly more beneficial from a, from a funding standpoint to go the PBRA route, um, but uh, that 
most housing authorities are learning now that that decision is driven by what's called a physical needs assessment. HUD will require you to do a physical needs assessment before they award the contract, and they will because they will require that as part of the conversion that you fund your critical needs first. Um, so that's why the physical, the physical needs assessment will what drive that after we do our physical needs assessment and based on what we determine is the work we need to do and the value of it, that will pretty much drive which route we will go. Mr. Horton, can I interject right there? Please, follow me. Um, For those of you who are fresh from the yeah, uh, yes, conference I, and fresh from the, the uh, <laughs> they did, show of this, this is excellent because they did a real convoluted presentation. Didn't and they, I think it left more people, you know, uh, bewildered and, and uninformed than informed, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But the question I want to ask you is PBRA uh, versus P. Um, it appeared that neither one of, of those particular programs really ensured financial stability for the housing authorities. And I was concerned about that, or real sustainability. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. Do either one of these programs protect us going forward? Does it, does it really provide financial uh, sustainability going forward? And I wasn't sure about that based on the presentation that we heard. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an excellent question. And for a lot of people who are concerned about HUD's rush to this program, as you know, the D in RAD stands for demonstration. This was ostensibly a pilot yeah, program. And a lot of people in the industry are saying that, that the pilot pool of that first 60,000 units, this should be a period of time in which their, their experiences are evaluated and then from that make a determination as whether or not this is a fit for other housing authorities. Um, as I discussed a couple of meetings ago, the challenge that housing authorities in the industry face are twofold. One is that HUD said that if you applied by 30 December, 31 December of last year, they would lock you in at the 2012 mm -hmm. rents, so you had a real incentive to apply. The second is that Congress is not appropriating any additional money to the RAD program. So they've lifted the cap now to 185,000 units, but they haven't funded it. So, so, so it begs the question of where is that money going to come from? The, the funding of the vouchers has to come from somewhere. And the, the, the conventional wisdom is that it's going to come from capitalizing the public housing program. So in many ways, you don't really have, so a lot, a lot of industry people such as ourselves are struggling with this dilemma because in many ways they're foreclosing other options for them. Mm -hmm. By the, if had Congress come up with a separate appropriation for the vouchers, then people would have felt that, okay, if I didn't go that route, um, my funding on the public housing platform was still secure. Mm -hmm. But at the same time that Congress is lifting the cap on the amount of units that can participate and not providing any funding for the program, the conventional wisdom is that HUD's going to fund those hundred eighty-five thousand dollars by reducing the funding to the public housing. So how do you minimize your risk going forward? So the, the so I think so so in answer to your direct to, to answer your question directly, I think that the only way that we really can minimize the risk going forward is through a physical, a thorough physical needs analysis, and then ask the question of does converting to red address these needs? I think that that's really the question as a board that you have to answer now. When I presented the application to the board a couple of months ago, one of the things that we did determine was that by converting to RAD, even without syndicating it or leveraging it, leveraging it with tax credits or bonds, but just the sheer conversion to Section 8 uh, vouchers, that that transition would yield about $3 million per development, as opposed to the current capital fund appropriation that we're getting now of $500,000 a year for all developments. So even though that $3 million, to answer your question, might not ensure sustainability of the buildings for the 20-year period of that hat, we know that it would take something like 50 years to raise that amount of money just through the capital fund program. So that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a question that a lot of agencies are struggling with, but all the needles still seem to be pointing that this is, is, makes sense to be the way to go. If I could just add, since we're pulling our conference report a little bit into this RAD discussion, one of the panelists was, I thought, actually very illuminating in that she, was, yeah. she had got, gone through the process already. North Carolina um, uh, executive director who had been through RAD and could see some of the things that maybe we couldn't see from our vantage point right. going in. Okay. And if I understood her correctly, Reverend Dawkins, please back me mm -hmm. up here or correct me. 
Uh, she seemed to think that after going through the uh, needs assessment, that they're required by HUD to invest in making modifications and repairs and remediations before going through the whole process and getting the payout at the end. Mm -hmm. So as she described it, she had to spend ten thousand dollars to borrow money to eventually exactly. pay herself back. That was the punchline okay. that really right. quieted right. the room. Right. Right. Um, right. Okay. Is that okay. is that your understanding of how this can work? And if so, you know, is there a cash flow issue? Right, right. right. Yeah, that is not what I heard, and that particular yeah. issue did not come up in Washington. I do know that under some FHA loans, HUD will require you to make certain certain repairs prior to closing, yes. because mm -hmm. they don't want the closing to occur until mm -hmm. certain, usually those are life safety issues, mm -hmm. not so much a roof or windows, but something like um, ADA, anything federal, fair housing, ADA compliance, something of that nature, they sometimes, Believe and that, it or not, mm -hmm. she claimed it was air conditioners. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's you can't thing. get she farther said, away from, well, well, no, 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 it's 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 that's how you get, but really, you know, when you think of how dire that should be, I mean, she was forthright. She said, "This is the possible outcome." Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so. Interesting. Okay. No, that I had not heard. That's yes, interesting. It, it was, so that's something it was to be that's something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do not believe. So it looks as if, uh, for us, that um, the Senate has acted. The House is not expected to act until after its summer recess, but before the new federal fiscal year begins in October. So we do believe that the the cap will be <coughs> in September of this year. Mm -hmm. And um, what so what so. That's where it does look as if uh, so. So this has been emailed to you. I'm not going to go through the entire presentation, but I do want to call your attention to page 19 of what uh, the consultant who, who made this presentation. Uh, this is what is recommended that how you spend your time. So this is how you this is how you should spend your summer vacation uh, and, and the fall. Um, assemble your development team, and we'll go into the, a little bit about that um, in a moment with Mr. Ross's presentation. Uh, work out a cooperative agreement with your local jurisdiction because it's entirely possible that your pilots may change, um, mm -hmm. the nature of your contracts with locally uh, may change. Um, conduct your physical conditions mm -hmm. assessment, so it's also called uh, physical needs assessment. Those terms are generally interchangeable even though to some people they, they mean different things. People typically use those in, in interchangeable. Uh, review your plans and modify, if any. Revisit agency impact issues. That's very, very significant. Um, and use the opportunity to engage your residents in the larger community. Uh, so uh, so this um, has been sent off to all the board members, and I would recommend that you read it. It's uh, no beds. Night stand is complete without it. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve, this is, I mean, really what we attempted to march up against with the redevelopment of Bartley. Right. Knowing that the capital funds program has been diminishing for years, having the big old structures just as patchwork, right. and it's more cost effective to take on the debt with a Section 8 voucher as payment and move forward with that model. That we know the other model is not going to work long term. Yeah, I think we've got two towers right. that we have to figure out how to make it work. But yes, right, exactly not. right. Two, I mean, the two senior towers yeah. and potentially Gracie as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that HUD has done is they've done a couple of things to streamline rent, so to really show that they're getting behind it. But one of the things they're allowing is rent bundling if it's budget neutral. And what I mean, is, for example, if you have $1,000 worth of Section 8 contracts, um, and if you want it, so they will allow you to take $600 with those units from Bracey and 400 <coughs> from your senior building and convert it for and as part of the conversion so you can rent bundle mm -hmm. um, so it does and so it also actually raises the issue one of the things we're looking at is whether or not we should we did not apply for RAD for Hartley um, but we may revisit that and apply for phase three oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. because we can do phase three with a section 8 contract it's only going to make it, you know, phase three is going to be a challenging phase as yeah. it is because it's the smallest phase um, and it still has all the same cost. Um, so if we can bundle it with a RAD contract, it might, might make a lot of sense. So thank you. Thank you for your attention there.
Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to move on to the vacated tenant arrears. Um, I think everyone has a copy of the vacated tenant arrears. Does everyone can have a copy? Can we on that slide for any reason? Yeah. Uh, no, we can, we can wait on that. I'd and like to with mm -hmm. That would make sense for me. And then in that case, then I'd like to move on to, we did have a little bit of comment from our commissioners with regard to the most recent conference, but if there's anything else that commissioners would like to add, I'd like to go into item seven on these things. Jeff? Uh, <coughs> you know, our focus was really on a lot of the sessions that address uh, board behavior, ethics, mm -hmm. relationship with our executive director. There was a session called. Trust you didn't learn anything, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing applied. There was a session um, titled um, The Chair, Too Much Power. Very interesting. Uh, I'm happy to say that a lot, a lot of what we heard um, doesn't apply. You know, we are a, a very cohesive group. Uh, but there are pitfalls, and it's good to know what they are. And, uh, um, there was um, recommendations for commission training, for a board retreat, um, something that I think we could definitely benefit from. Mm -hmm. It's been, been a little while since we've done that sort of um, review of our own activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in addition to that, we, we had talked about after uh, going through uh, uh, the session on uh, the chair and, and the commissioner's functioning, uh, Leo Dower did the presentation. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Very experienced, yes. yes. very experienced. Uh, he's still kicking? He's still kicking. <laughs> yes, he yes. is. He's still kicking. Mm -hmm. Actually, he, he was my instructor for my PHM years ago, so he's been around forever. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but um, what we came from, what we got from uh, his presentation is that we definitely need a board retreat. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is marry uh, the training and the retreat together one day, mm -hmm. which is something that can be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second thing is that we need to develop an instrument for the board to evaluate ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in like what I'm seeing right now in this recovery unit. Mm -hmm. we, we need to evaluate ourselves because HUD is doing that yes. for us. Yes. So we need to do that. So those are two things that came on. Thank you. Did you get recommendations for how to achieve those goals? Uh, or do you have them we, from that? We did. There yeah. was material, and we were able to uh, come back and maybe we can share those. Yes. Sure. Yes. And actually, um, HUD has offered to us, and we have accepted technical assistance from a HUD contractor called Econometrica. Econometrica. Mm -hmm. So. Um, they've given us the dates that they're going to be here mm -hmm. uh, doing an on-site visit and assessment um, so as to determine the, what technical assistance they're going to mm -hmm. provide us. So I'll make that, you know, we're preparing a list of things that we'd like to have them do for us as well, such as update our policies. We have a whole series of policies, many which serve as well, but have not been updated in quite some time. So there's a whole series of things that we're going to ask them to do, but we'll raise that as well. But if you could, Angela, Mm -hmm. Certainly to the board, the dates that the Metro will be here right. uh, to meet with staff. So this uh, like this conference, <coughs> as is often the case, was also also had a vendor exhibition mm -hmm. attached to it, mm -hmm. and um, there are all kinds of purveyors now. Online training, as you would imagine, is is, is big. Mm -hmm. and that's you know, worthwhile. I, to me, that would augment it. I don't think it should take the place mm -hmm. of live training, mm -hmm. um, but there there. No shortage of options. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd like to move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Richard Ross to introduce himself to you, tell you a little bit about him, probably. And me. Oh, forgive me. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Miss Angela Farish uh, also attended the training and wanted to make yes. a brief presentation. I'm sorry. Um, I oh, you did have any. You yes. listened to yourself. Yeah, I was going to say. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough to attend New Orleans with Sheila and Beverly Scott. It was in 2011, and we had went on a tour of the public of what happened in the Ninth Ward. Mm -hmm. And this is just an update. I just printed out some photos of what has taken place since then. 
and there are attached to it is some statistical data on where New Orleans is at, especially the lower ninth ward, which receives most of the devastation. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Eight years post Katrina, only 30% of low income residents of the lower ninth ward returned back to the area. 30% compared to the 90% in the rest of the city. Over 1.5 million residents left their homes. One of the greatest obstacles that prevented low income families from returning back was lack of affordable housing they had prior to Katrina. Mm -hmm. Only four years after Katrina, the house, the home rates went up 40 percent. Four years after. So you can imagine this eight years now with the rents on. Mm -hmm. So the first photo you can see what the devastation was. Okay. The second photo actually Alisa, myself, and Charles Morgan, we stood where that wall is at. You can see the barge. They said the barge kept hitting yes. the levee. So you can actually see. And we were standing there. That's how high the water was. And on the third photo, it shows this was um, taken off of a memorial they had did over by where the, um, the, the, the wall was broken, the levee was broken. And the levee was broken in three places. The, the next photo right here, this, we're in a car, because everybody kept saying, you know, it's a lake, and I just assumed, you know, right. just a lake, <laughs> but it actually looks like the ocean, you know, wow. and you can see that much water impact from, you know. Like the, the Great Lakes, like in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Chicago, yeah. <laughs> and you can see the height of the wall in the next photo, how, you know, they wow. did build it up. If you just, if I can just yeah. go, this orange arrow mm -hmm. is that wall. You think that that's very that, that, oh, that's yeah. wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's, yes. that's how far it all moved. Yeah. Wow. And it was very, really, very quickly. We had um, a taxi driver take us around, and we had met him the last time. Mm -hmm. um, his name was Wilbert, but we affectionately called him Knife. So mm -hmm. I hooked back up with him, and then he took us back out again. And he explained to us, like, you know, what the resolve of the people, because a lot of, in that area where the first impact happened, the homes you can see are really close back to the levee. And people came back, and they, you know, actually lived, you know, right where the impact happened. Little, little, little yeah. And the new construction is... Beautiful and seemingly state of the art. Yeah, that's on the so, second to last page. So this is the public it. housing. Yeah. <laughs> the second to last page shows the new public housing. Oh, okay. And the and the page before that is public housing that was destroyed, but it's still there. Has not been repaired, and this is only a few blocks away. It hasn't been repaired. No, this is what it actually looks like now. The second to last. They said there are a lot of landlords who just uh, well. The third to last page. But this from is private housing. You see whole developments abandoned. Yeah. Land, and this is what the public housing looks like now. This is what, and this is what it looks like. What it still looks like is like, say like a couple of blocks away. How large was this complex? That was, it, that was huge. That's that was when, yeah, and that so, was pretty yeah. big. That and was nothing surprising. Was done? Mm -mm. Nothing and on this photo, no. this is actual, someone did like a memorial of right. this. this is a the homes of a were actually park. sitting on here. Oh, on those stones? On those stones. Mm -hmm. And they were. Were they alive? Yeah. And you no, see a lot nature of Nature is taking over. Nature. Everything nature. is nature. growing back. Nature. But nature. Yeah. Nature. Oh, no. You look down and you see the front wall. You guys also got a chance to see uh, Brad Pitt's uh, project. Yes, well. his property. Right. I have photos of that. Well, that's so what I'm saying. Cool it's, yeah. it's wonderful, and there are a dozen houses in a vast sea of This is 
So with the new public housing, are there lots of, um, are they bringing it back, for example, like we're doing here, with um, any kind of recreation schools? Or are you just saying well, these are communities? What the schools we found out, a lot of the schools which were public, now they're becoming charter schools. Right, right. So they are, you know, one site we did this that they would they build. Were, yeah. We saw new schools. New schools. Times times. Times. Well, I guess specifically what I'm asking, we were there, and Dr. Mm -hmm. one of the public housing projects that was underway, pretty much underway. You, you got the sense of community. You know, mm -hmm. you actually mm -hmm. saw they had a movie theater, there was a gym, there was you're, you're schools on, no. the on, on a campus setting, you know, no. colleges mm -hmm. and not. Uh, Supermarkets, just very, very community oriented. No, no just commercial. Just, no commercial uses. Nope. We do see some recreational uses. The schools are being built, but it's really sitting very mm -hmm. Including the ankle slopes. So, how close were what you visited to where these are? Why do you think such a change? I'm not sure because it was. It was really in, it, it was in the like what I understand. I just don't know, you know, geographically how close it was to where you guys were. I was so impressed, you know, I had to, to photograph this, because, you know, it was just amazing. We also told her for whatever reason, my board is gigantic. Yes, yeah, huge, yeah. my understanding. So mm -hmm. It could have been, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, near the levee, far from the levee. Right, and, and I, it was my first time, and I was taken around by, you know, family members I just met, so it was like everything, mm -hmm. I didn't know where I was, mm -hmm. they were trying to explain things, but you know, for me, it, it was so new, everything was so new. It was incredible. But this is something, because this doesn't even look like the place that I was right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. no, thank, thank you for that presentation, thank you very much. Very, 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 very. Yeah. Um, Sufficiently yes, satisfied that everyone got a very good learning experience. Yes. Oh, so, it was a full of Great. Thank you all for coming out. Right. So, I, I am at this point I'm going to introduce Mr. Richard Ross, who's going to uh, discuss a little bit about the draft RFP for Grace. Uh, so, as board members know, there's a sense that based on where Heritage Homes is at this point in time, that it is appropriate for us to begin thinking about the redevelopment of the Bracey, Peter Bracey apartment. Uh, what, is, what is being presented to you at this point in time is a draft. Um, it is not for attribution or circulation. It is a, a, a draft only. Um, but what I'm asking board members to do is to begin to just please uh, read through this, um, be thoughtful and intentional about the review of it, and uh, we will discuss it again at both our, um, our July and, it, and our August meeting, if we do meet in August as, at the board's pleasure, but with the hopes that we can, and one of the determinations is whether or not it's appropriate to circulate this now to some of our stakeholders for input, or whether or not you want to have the opportunity to review it a little bit more before it, and I begin to circulate that to some of our stakeholders. So at this point, it's just an internal document for the board. Um, but, Mr. but Mr. Ross will walk you through it and just, just talk to the board a little bit about yourself, Richard. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm Richard Ross. Uh, my company is Ross Asset Management. It's just my background brief briefly. I spent 15 years working on Wall Street at uh, Lehman Brothers and Bank of America and uh, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority um, working uh, in, in securitizations and mortgage finance. Uh, after I left Wall Street, I went to the real estate development and community development world. I worked for the South Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation for eight years. I ran the investment fund there as well as developed affordable housing, uh, mainly tax credit housing. And uh, from there, I went to work for a private developer called Cottage International, uh, which also did uh, development and property management of uh, tax credit housing and affordable housing. Where are they located? Uh, Yonkers. Yonkers, New York. So I ask us to us to assist us in drafting the RFP. You will not be submitting a response to the RFP. You will not be a developer partner and he's simply here to provide the technical assistance to the housing authority right. so that we can so I can prepare the RFP in a timely way and get it to why fo focus on some of the other functions that I've got to focus on rather than it wait to the fall uh, but because I want to try and pursue these tracks parallel so, so just wanted to put 
Oh, put, yeah. put, put that in. No I have way. no involvement in the right. right, right. Uh, but I have the background to um, evaluate developers and um, and to get intimately involved into the investment and financing of these projects. So uh, I just put together a brief outline of the RFP. I know you haven't had a chance to really um, look at it, but uh, we uh, first outlined the goals for the redevelopment of, uh, of the Bracey Apartments. And uh, we, we saw the goals as, number one, to bring in some potential development income and development fees uh, for the authority. Um, second, we would also like to increase the apartment count if possible, thereby increasing the rents uh, to the authority. Um, third, we want to minimize the amount of disruption uh, in the income to the authority and HUD uh, during the development um, of the project. Um, so we thought those were those were some of the key goals um, to this redevelopment. Uh, we just list some background development on New Rochelle. You know the demographics. Uh, transportation, uh, a little bit of history on the town. Um, third, we put together uh, the framework for the project, which we said uh, briefly to find a, a strong, financially stable, and experienced co-developer. Um, and right now it's in the, uh, up in the air as whether the housing authority will be the lead or, or if this strong <coughs> development partner will be the lead. That, that was left open at this point. Um, we mapped out the scope of work, which is essentially um, the same scope that you would have if you were building a real estate project. Um, the the, the co-developer will be responsible for planning, um, including site plans, architectural plans, any um, approvals that need to be obtained by the city or any other authority, um, arranging for the financing of the project, as well as you know, providing whatever uh, bonding capabilities are, are needed to, to pull this off, and the uh, and the construction of the project. Uh, we put down the requirements for the responses, and you know those requirements include um, what are your plans for this project, um, site planning, um, architectural planning. If you're going to increase the housing, which is really a, a basic requirement of this project, by how much? And what hurdles do you foresee in doing this and, and, and how are you going to overcome those hurdles? And lastly, uh, selection criteria, uh, which some of the key ones include construction experience uh, in affordable housing, development experience in affordable housing, uh, financing experience. Uh, in affordable housing and uh, preferably a commercial development as well. It would be nice at the end of the day to see this project as having market rate housing, affordable housing, and some retail uh, development to you know, provide services uh, to the people that live there and to provide an attractive environment for, for the residents. You know, at the end of the day, it would be great to see an improved uh, property with more apartments and more commercial development and a lively place, almost a, a, a destination uh, for the residents there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who were um, here at the beginning of the Hartley Redevelopment, you'll recognize this RFP as the template that was used for that. Um, so we were still wordsmithing. One of the RFQ. RFQ, thank you. Excuse me, RFQ. To dis separate at this point in time my recommendation and I want to stress that we are very early on in the process this is literally the first half step um, in the process um, and we will stay at this stage for as long as it takes for the board to feel that we are ready for the next stage all the more reason why I want to get this process started sooner rather than later um, but I do want to assure the board that um, this is extremely early in the process um, it's entirely likely, it's entirely possible that the document that you have here before you will in no way, shape, or form resemble the final, and that's okay, uh, but it's, a, it's really a starting point. I would like to turn the board's attention to the section um, requirement for responses. It's uh, 
section five or Roman numeral five. It's uh, about the second to last page of the graph RFP. And while you'll see that some of it is boilerplate that was clearly lifted from the original Hartley RFP, for example, you'll see the Pope Six references still in there. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, um, you'll see some very significant differences um, of first time events for the housing authorities, such as um, uh, part criteria one, experience in the construction and development of market rate as well as affordable. And that is clearly a first time um, you know, enterprise for the housing authority. Um, experience in developing retail and commercial property. Um, you know, the, my, at this point in time, my, my sense is that the successful respondents will have, if not a retail partner, certainly a retail intelligence capacity to determine what would be the appropriate. Thing. We can want an Apple store all we want, but if the intelligence comes says Quiznos, you know, so it's not so important that a person who built a Gap store respond as much as a person who uh, has the capacity to determine what what is the appropriate market and, and commercial uses. So those are the types of uh, changes that you'll see begin to weave itself into uh, this uh, RFP. And the board determines that this template that we borrowed for expediency's sake from the Hartley RFP is too, if, it take, if it's too difficult to rewind it or to rework it and easily just to start from scratch, then that's what we'll do, but this was the initial first blush. Uh, so um, I've asked uh, Mr. Ross to assist us with that um, so that the board produces a document that you think fully expresses what our vision for that area is. Um, but at some point in time, we'll make the recommendation that the board uh, circulate the document to both the city of Nurshell and to HUD, who will be a very clear partners in this. Um, and that will be made at the point in time when the board feels that it's, it, it's first blush is a fully representative of what your initial thinking is. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions on that, but again, my, my thinking is that uh, we'll discuss this again at the July meeting and um, then ask you to, uh, over the summer as you are um, recreating on your deck with uh, <laughs> lemonade and you're in an expansive uh, mood to begin to uh, think about uh, this process and it's my hope that we will begin it earnestly in the fall. Question. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me. Will there be any displacement of the residents during this, once this process takes place, will there, in, will there be any displacement of the residents? Where will, where will they be relocated to, on site, off site? What happens with the residents? No, I, I, I do understand your question, and, and I, I would answer that a couple of ways. One is that if no or minimal displacement is a requirement of the board, then that will be a requirement of the RFQ. Uh, that's one. And two, I would say that I think certainly the, our experience with heritage homes in terms of the way that right. was managed, I think right. that that's I think it's safe to say that that type of approach would be very much part and parcel of this. And three, finally, the um, the campus at Gracie as well as the other inventory in the housing authority I think will will give us the resources to, to make sure that there's no that there's no displacement. That's something that the board feels is a priority. I just like the idea of self slash lead development. <laughs> I like that idea. I'm on yeah. board with that. <laughs> we do have, again, you know, so that the, the, the residents are in one part of a larger site. And that's really our best option. Physically, where you can move through exactly as it happened on Hartley, is what I would hope for. But uh, as Mr. Hartley says, we'll discuss it formally and come to agreement. Exactly. Exactly. And one of the things, Steve, that we did explore um, in, uh, in this, this past couple of years was the parking situation. And considering, you know, the downtown location and the need um, that's there, that's also an element that we have to think whether that's going down in the earth or going up. Right. Exactly. Um, right. There's a revenue source in a commercial sense. Sure. So we can exploit also right. if we've got the size. That's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. 
Great. So, uh, so this will be forwarded to um, board members, and um, uh, and as uh, Ms. Sanders said, we'll begin the process of discussing it formally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your report plus. Mm -hmm. We're on to agenda item four. Is there any old business carrying over from mm -hmm. last month?